we want to welcome you to the book of Revelation verse by verse. Now, that may be a little bit optimistic because we may often go concept by concept or else we'll never get out of the book at all. But we're going to be studying this book verse by verse. And I need you to understand something, that your generation has a specific hold on this book. This book holds more relevance for you than for any other generation. So as we study this book and as we go through this book verse by verse, one thing I want you to know at the very beginning so that you know when we get to the end of each service, we're going to be talking about the nation of Israel. We're going to be talking a lot about the Jewish people. And that's why at the end of each service, we're going to receive an offering, a portion of which for every offering is going to go toward preaching the gospel in the nation of Israel. Isn't that a blessing? And if you're interested in going to Israel with us, all you have to do is visit EncounterToday.com to sow a seed into the work of God in Israel or to get more information about how you can go with us to the Holy Land because we've got a trip coming up just for you. Everybody said amen. amen. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter number one. Who are we? We are the Revelation generation. Who are we? We are the Revelation generation. This book divides believers into two categories. Those who can't seem to get into the book and those who can't seem to get out of the book. It divides Christians into the fearful and the fanatical. But one thing is certain, the devil hates this book. Somebody say, the devil hates this book. Genesis exposes him, but Revelation condemns him. And don't you allow him to lie to you. This is potentially the most important book in the entire Bible. You wouldn't stop reading a good book at the final chapter. You wouldn't walk out on a good movie in the last 30 minutes. This book is the climax. It is the crescendo. It is the apex of the work of God, the manifestation of the fullness of everything he's been working toward, and it is the most important book in the Bible. Is it any wonder the devil has done his darndest to keep people out of this book? People think it is a hidden book. People think it's a book filled with mysteries. Don't you be deceived by it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 that our God is not the author of confusion. This book is not a book of confusion. I said this book is not a book of confusion. In fact, the enemy is the God of confusion. To say that the book of Revelation is confusing is tantamount to saying Satan is the author of it. Satan is not the author of this book. Jesus is the author of this book. The Holy Ghost, the Father which is in heaven, has authored this book, and he has written it just for you. Without this book, there is no conclusion to the story. There is no, they lived happily ever after. There is no the end. There is no amen. But in this book, can you imagine if the Bible ended in Jude? Some of you don't even know what Jude says. But it wouldn't be a good picture if it just ended in Jude. We need the whole story wrapped up. God would never design anything with the intent to confuse you. God would never design anything to scare you. 1 Corinthians not 13, but 14.33 says, He is not the author of confusion. We often approach this book with an assumption of difficulty, which guarantees it. I was at one time for a very short period of time, trying out a free month of a very difficult workout routine. It was like a boot camp style of a circuit kind of workout, and it was exhausting, the kind that would make you want to lose your lunch. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you are blessed because you don't know what I'm talking about? Okay. And we got to the final, the final part of the circuit, the end of the workout. I am exhausted. And we get to the part where I got to get those weights, put them on my chest, and pop them up. And I get them, and I, get, I, I lift those weights one time. But as I get to the second time, I just can't do it. It's too heavy. I'm exhausted. And every attempt to lift it exhausts me even more. I'm not getting more capable of lifting it each time I try. I'm getting less capable. Right? Because I'm wearing myself out with each try. 
And the trainer that was with me there, the personal trainer said, now just hold on, let me remove some of these weights, and I am bent over, I am trying to catch my breath. He says, all right, now give this a try. This will be easy for you. And I took those weights, and I popped them up, and did them one, two, three, four, five times, and set them back on the rack, and said, that was easy. And I looked, he added more weight. He did not take weight off. He added more weight, but I thought it was lighter. The presumption of difficulty, the assumption of complexity, brings us to a place when we open this book where we're already confused before we even start reading it. But the reality is, you can read it. You can understand it. In fact, this is the only book that promises a blessing to those who read it and a curse upon those who try to remove or add to it. People say, well, you know, I don't need to understand the book of Revelation because I'm not going to be here. The problem with that is that Jesus said you need to keep the sayings of this book. How are you going to keep the sayings of the book if you don't know what it says? Excuse me while I make so much sense. How many of you were reading the book of Revelation for your devotional time this week? Just no, no. Most people without some sort of push avoid it entirely. But the Bible says, hear, read, keep the sayings of this book, and you will be blessed. How many of you could stand to be blessed a little bit more? So let's begin the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 1, and let's just read. I'm not going to stop. This is hard. This is difficult for me. We're just going to read straight through, and then we'll come back through and dissect it as best we can, verse by verse or concept by concept. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. Oh, I tell you right now, it's happening, isn't it? We're obeying this passage of Scripture. It's happening right now. Everybody say blessed. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and forever. And the church said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and I being turned. I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 
And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet, that it is a light unto our path. Illuminate us tonight. Enlighten our path so that we may not stumble in the darkness of this day, but find our way around the snares and the traps of the enemy. Your word says that all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. As we approach the study of this book, we thank you today that this book is inspired and it is profitable to us. May we receive all of its profits and walk in it for the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. The Bible is the most unique history book in all of literature. It reaches farther back than any other book and much farther forward than any other book. The book of the Revelation it's a very unique book. I would think it is the greatest work of literature known to man. At first sight, it may appear to be complicated, but it was written to ordinary people. Everybody say, just like you. It was written not to theological professionals, not to doctrinarians who are studying for their theological thesis. It was written to regular people to the people of the seven churches that is now what is called Western Turkey. They were not highly educated. They did not have what we would call a fifth grade education. They were just regular people. However, it was written to ordinary people a long time ago in a culture far, far away, so it does us good to look at their culture to try to put ourselves in their shoes to understand who he's talking to and what they're going through but we must not overcomplicate it. This book was written for a practical purpose. It was not written to satisfy your curiosity concerning future events. If that's the way you read it, then you misread it. It was written very simply to prepare you for what's coming. Everybody say preparation. It only mentions the future so that you can be prepared for it. When you understand that, then you understand the meaning of everything in this book. It doesn't matter what it is. If someone were to ask you tomorrow, even though we haven't gotten to it yet, if they were to ask you, well, what do the seven heads and the ten horns mean? You could say, I can tell you exactly what they mean. They mean, get ready. <laughs> What does the little horn mean? I'll tell you what it means. You better get ready. Jesus is coming. Everybody say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Someone once said there are, uh, th these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the weakest of these is hope because the church focuses a lot on love. It focuses a lot on faith, but we're often short on hope. Hope, not a wish, not what you desire to happen, Bible hope is what you know is going to happen. This kind of hope anchors you in difficult times. I want you to get this. What we know is going to happen anchors us when the unexpected happens. What we know is going to happen stabilizes us when the unexpected happens. That's why this book begins and ends with a notice that Jesus is coming. Oh, how we need it. 
Oh, how we need it in our culture today, even in our political system. Have you noticed that every single election, even here in America, is increasingly more and more messianic? This is the one that's going to fix it all. This is the one that's going to cause the oceans to stop rising and bring the temperatures down. Oh, no, this is the one that's going to drain the swamp and put an end to corruption. Let me help every one of you on every side of the aisle. None of them are the one, but there is one who's going to fix it all, and he's coming soon and very soon. Somebody say amen and hallelujah. As the darkness intensifies, the church will need this blessed hope more than anything else in the world. So let us walk through this revelation together. Revelation chapter number 1, chapter number 1, and verse number 1. Here's what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him. You never saw it before. This is not John's revelation of Jesus. This is Jesus' revelation that was given to him by the Father. This is insight into a personal conversation between God the Father and God the Son that was then transmitted to John. Keep your place here in Revelation chapter 1 and go with me to John chapter 16 very quickly. John chapter 16. Now, we have an extensive teaching on the first few chapters of the book of Revelation already on our YouTube channel. I have made them free for the moment. They will not be forever. So if you go to our Encounter Today YouTube channel, you search Alan DeDio on YouTube, or if you search Encounter Christ Church on YouTube, you'll see our Encounter Today channel, and click on Playlists. And there you'll see a playlist titled The Book of Revelation that I just created. And when you go in there to the Book of Revelation, you will have a series of seven messages, nearly six hours of teaching, an introduction to the book, and then the seven churches of Revelation. Because next week, possibly, depending on how this goes tonight, we will pick up at the end of that in chapter number four. But we'll see how things go. Because it's so important. The teachings of Jesus there and those first three chapters are the most important message from God to the church today in your Bible, and you need to know it. So make sure you avail yourself to it. John chapter 16. Are you there? Well, I am not. Who are we? You better believe it. John chapter 16 and verse number 13. If you're there, say yes. How be it when he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth or revelation, when he, the spirit of revelation, has come, he will guide you into all revelation. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, said I, that he shall take of mine, and he will show it unto you. What a promise. Fulfilled here in Revelation 1 and verse 1. Jesus makes this astounding promise. Everything that the Father has belongs to me, and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to reveal it to you. Revelation is the currency of the kingdom. Possession comes by revelation. You can't have something until it's revealed to you. Everything that you need, want, or desire of him has already been provided in Christ Jesus. The question is whether or not it has been revealed to you. The moment the cover is removed, that's what revelation means, to remove a cover, or some people call this apocalypse. We'll discuss the terminology of the end times in a coming service. Apocalypse simply means an uncovering, an unveiling to remove the cover. Isn't it interesting? The one book that's called Uncovering, Unveiled, Revealed is the one we think is mysterious, hidden, and can't be understood. Sounds like something the devil would do, isn't it? He's a liar. This book belongs to you. And Jesus said, everything the Father's told me, I call you not servants any longer, John 15, verse 15. For the servant knoweth not what the master is doing, but I have called you friends, because everything that I have heard from my father, I am making known unto you. How important is it 
in our lives to be able to hear the Holy Spirit to show us, don't go that way. Don't do that. Don't say that. Or, here's Jesus. You know, the answer to every prayer you'll ever pray is a revelation of Jesus. That's so vitally important. You don't need your bill paid. You need a revelation of Jesus. And that revelation will usher over you and shower on you like a waterfall and wash away your debt and pay your bill. We've got to realign our focus. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants. Hear me, you have a God-given right to understand this book. This book was written for you. Why? Who are we? This book was written for you. You have the right to understand it. And when you open up, you ought to open it up with the confidence. This book belongs to me. I have a right to understand this book, and I'm going to get everything I can out of it. Hallelujah. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Say it's coming soon. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. Blessed means empowered to prosper. Empowered to prosper. Empowered to overcome is he that readeth. And he that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits of God which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Here, in the first few verses of Revelation, we have the Trinity revealed to us in all of its glory, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He mentions the seven spirits of God. It is reiterated again in the book of Revelation. We will discuss that in later services or in those messages that you can go find on our YouTube channel. The seven spirits of God are the seven manifestations of the Holy Ghost, the seven aspects of the personality of the Holy Spirit. And you can study that uh, with us as we go forward in this study. But here's, here's what it says that I want you to get a hold of. It says it was written by John John, you understand, the Apostle John, the man who was closer to Jesus than any other human being on the face of the earth. John knew him better than anyone. John stood by him. He was the only disciple left to stand by him at the cross. John, so vitally important to the ministry of Jesus that in his dying moments, Jesus looks at John and says, Behold your mother. And Jesus entrusted the care of Mary to the Apostle John. John, who went and took over the, the pastorate at Ephesus. John, as you will study in those messages we have on YouTube, was a political prisoner on the island of Patmos, 20 miles off the coast of Ephesus. There, amongst murderers and thieves, he found himself a little cave. And the Bible says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. But this is very important before we continue. This book was written by a man who was suffering politically for the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it was written to people who were suffering politically and socially because of their testimony of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that the truth of this book is really only open to those who suffer for Christ's sake. Calamity clarifies. Comfort confuses. How often have you found it in your life where you were so comfortable, you got your priorities mixed up. But then something bad happens. Now, do not get me wrong. God does not send sickness, disease, or calamity into your life. But we bring it upon ourselves, don't we? And the enemy can help us out too. And when it does, what happens? Oh, all of a sudden we're back in church. All of a sudden, we're putting things down that we knew we should not have taken up. All of a sudden, we get our priorities right. Calamity clarifies. Comfort confuses. 
The American church may have trouble understanding this, but there are persecuted believers all over the world who cherish the book of Revelation and use it as an anchor for their troubled souls in difficult times. Intellectuals, theologians grapple with its revelation, but those who are living it find blessing in its pages. Those who are willing to stand boldly in the face of persecution, those who are willing to say what God says to whom God says to say it and care less what they think about it, can find comfort and revelation in these pages. Chapter 1 and verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. What does that mean, patience of Jesus? It means waiting on Jesus. I'm your companion. We're all waiting on him. Was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. Mark chapter 4 says affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Leonard Ravenhill once said, if Jesus preached what preachers today preach, he would have never been crucified. He said, John said, I, like you, am suffering for my testimony. Hmm. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Three possibilities as to what the Lord's day can mean. Three possibilities I will give you from the least likely to the most likely or the least accepted to the most accepted. Number one, when Domitian became emperor and he took over, he required that once a year everyone offer an incense offering. He, he demanded that everyone call him Lord Caesar, Lord and God and worship him. And since he wanted to be declared Lord, that one time a year was called the Lord's Day, the day when you are to declare him as Lord. And some would say it was that day that John had this revelation that Jesus... <laughs> is Lord. Certainly possible. Another possibility is that the Lord's Day is a reference to the day of the Lord as mentioned all throughout Bible prophecy, which is the day of his triumph, the day of his glorious second coming when he overcomes all of the enemies and establishes his kingdom. That is the day of the Lord or the Lord's Day. But more likely than any of the others, it is simply the Lord's Day meaning the day that the early church would worship and would celebrate. We often mistake and get things mixed up and we think that we worship on the Sabbath. We actually do not worship on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday, Friday evening to Saturday evening. We worship on the Lord's Day because that is the day of his resurrection, a celebration of his resurrection where we no longer have one day that's holy. Every day is holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so on the Lord's Day, even though there was no church in sight, in fact, on the Isle of Patmos, there was a temple to the goddess Diana, and all were even commanded to worship there. And there was a power struggle, according to some extra-biblical sources, where John stood against the worshipers of a Diana, and God manifested his mighty power and saw many converts on the island. In fact, it is said that when John left the island of Patmos, many wept and cried of the prisoners who were on that island because they would miss him. What a powerful witness he had even there because in that cave he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Let us continue to read beginning with verse number 12. Hallelujah. Are you enjoying this? And I turned to see the voice. We're about to see Jesus like we've never seen him before. I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first, and I am the last. Now this is fascinating. Here we have the only description, physical description, 
of Jesus recorded in the entirety of the Bible. And it is apropos that the Apostle John is the one to write it. Because as we said earlier, no one knew him better than John. The Bible says it was John that laid his head on Jesus' chest. It sounds strange to you, but they would eat around a table very tightly, no chairs, and they would recline all in one direction. Everyone was leaning on everyone else. Your feet, in fact, I would be over here on your chest, and my feet would be over there on the person. That's why they would wash their feet. Your feet's in somebody's face when you're eating. But he was the one that Jesus would have right next to him. Jesus said, if I'm going to have one man right next to me to hear everything I have to say, to know what I'm going through, it's going to be John. And how many of you know of that if you were John, you would never forget that face? John had seen him wipe the blindness out of Bartimaeus' eyes. John had watched him cry out in the middle of the night and pray until sweat became as great drops of blood. John saw him transfigured. John was with him on the cross. John was there and saw him in his resurrection splendor, but he was not prepared for what he was about to see. He was about to see him in a way that he had never seen him before. Oh, this may mess with your theology. He was the same but very different. You are the same person you were when you were in kindergarten, but you are very different. We have trouble with this, you know, because the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the Jesus of the Gospels is the Jesus for me. He is not the same. That is not who he is entirely. The Bible says that Jesus, while he was on this earth, grew in wisdom and favor and stature. And now here in the book of Revelation, he's full grown. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, Arnold Schwarzenegger. They are the same as they were when they were five years old. But if you knew them when they were five and then you met them on the street today, it would be a very different encounter. How many of you would know that's true? They are the same, but they are different. John knew him better than any other, and yet when he sees him now, he is terrified. He falls, hits the dirt as a dead man. This Jesus is very different from the Gospels. We all agree that Jesus is our example. The question is, which Jesus is our example? Is it the, what some would perceive to be the vindictive God of the Old Testament? Is it the lovey-dovey, forgive everybody, Jesus of the Gospels? Is it the Jesus of the epistles that demands excommunication? Is it the violent Jesus of the book of the Revelation where the prophet said, peering into the future, even in the Old Testament, seeing him, who is this with dyed garments of Bozrah? And they asked him, why are your garments red? And he said, I've been trampling on my enemies, and it is the blood of my enemies. Which Jesus, WWJD, what would Jesus do? The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that gives us a true picture of who he really is. To give a description of him in the Gospels, to give us a physical description of him there, would be irrelevant. Were you to have seen him then, were you there to have a perfect description of him then, would do you no good. He would still at this moment be unrecognizable to you. This is a description of who he is eternally. Ah. If, what if I told you that the signs of a violent Savior are all throughout the New Testament? We've just had his image so whitewashed, so watered down. The propaganda campaign has been so successful to make him palatable to a backslidden generation that we have managed to emasculate him 
and picture him as some effeminate being with a limp wrist and pale skin walking through the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem kissing women and bouncing babies on his knee. Mark Galley rightly points out there's a Gumby-like flexibility given to Jesus in the modern church where he bends over backwards, this Jesus, this Savior, to be nice, ever welcoming, ever inviting, ever affirming. While we mock the long-haired evangelist on the street with a picket sign that says, Repent, for the end is nigh. What if we're wrong? What if Jesus' message and ministry is more closely connected to the radical on the street than the volunteer in the soup kitchen? What if we've missed him? What if he's both? What if we wiped the greasy grace out of our eyes and saw the Jesus of the New Testament for who he really is? One who would never sugarcoat his message, especially to those closest to him. What if we find a Jesus that storms in and out of people's lives, making implicit demands and generally making everybody uncomfortable? The truth is, that you'll find a man who strictly orders people he heals, is furious at religious leaders, kills a herd of pigs without regret or compensation, calls the Sadducees ignorant, describes an entire generation as faithless, rebukes his closest friend, and calls him a devil. He would often frighten people with his miracles, and he frightened his friends in the way he dealt with storms. His inner circle was literally terrified at the transfiguration. He started a riot in the temple and overthrew the money chambers. Not once, twice. Dear God, what do you think would define your life? If you spent, if you spent all your life being lovey and dovey and caring for everyone and then walked into the United States Senate and started turning over tables and beating people with a whip, What do you think your life would be defined as, the defining moment? And then what would happen if you did it again? Twice. (laughs) He would frighten people. You say, Pastor Allen, I don't like the way you're talking about my Jesus. You're scaring me. Good. Now you know how John felt. Terrified at the sight of him, much less what was about to take place. This aspect, oh, this is so important. Jesus is meek and wild. Who are we? He is the living water, but he's also the consuming fire. He calms the storm, but he is a raging storm that either saves or destroys everything in his wake. Either you will fall on him and be broken, or he will fall on you and you will be crushed. This aspect of divinity that we thought was under lock and key in the Old Testament has always been there throughout the Gospels and the Epistles, finally revealed for who he is in the book of Revelation. Annie Dillard rightly states, On the whole, I do not find Christians sufficiently sensible of their conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Think about that. Does anyone have any idea what sort of power we invoke when we say the name of Jesus? Do you even know when you say at the end of your prayer, in Jesus' name, who you are invoking? You are not invoking the the tanned, long, lean Galilean hugging people by the seashore. You are invoking he whose hair is like wool, whose eyes are like fire, and out of his mouth comes a sharp, two-edged sword after all. Who do you want fighting for you? The one bouncing babies on his knee or the one with a sword coming out of his mouth? When you pray in the name of Jesus, you are coming against the forces of darkness, and you don't have just a lamb sitting by your side. You have the lion of the tribe of Judah sitting by your side. 
Annie Dillard went on to say, the churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sticks, sets, mixing up a batch of TNT. She said, it's madness for ladies to wear straw hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. We should lash ourselves to the pews and prepare for what's coming because he's meek and wild. And the story of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, they hear about Aslan for the first time, that he is a lion. And they say, is he safe? And they said, oh, it's not safe. No, he's not safe, but he's good. It's not to say that God is not love, but I believe it is accurate to say that we have become deaf to the richer parts of the symphony of love and what love really is. Do you realize that hell is love? When you think of God's goodness, do you realize that hell is the goodness of God? After all, is it good to punish evil? We have created for ourselves an image of him that makes us warm and comfortable. And it's time we get a revelation. We hear the melody played by the strings, but we ignore the brass, the wind, and especially the percussion sections. We do not notice the strong harmonies, the counterpoint, the dissonant chords. Because it's just nicer, and we have a nice little melody, and feels good, and sticks in our head. But there's more calling. Will you turn with me very quickly to the book of Matthew chapter 16? And I think this is where we will conclude our teaching tonight. Matthew chapter 16. Pastor, you should forgive me because that's what Jesus would do. That's right. He would forgive you. But then he'd kick you out. Until you repented. Read the epistles. It's important that we understand this, this notion of we must pursue love is generally a means of pursuing a lack of accountability. Because if, if you were loving, you would forgive me. Yeah, but if you knew the love of God, you would be on your knees saying, how did I hurt you? What did I do? And how can I make it right? Matthew 16. That's what love does. Matthew 16. And verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? I, the Son of Man, am. And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Please understand the implications of that statement. It means Messiah. It means the coming king who will conquer. Peter here is getting a glimpse of the revelation that John received. The son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, Blessed. Do you see? The same thing is happening here as was happening in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that hear, that, that reads, that hears, that keeps these saying. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Now we're going to look at what that blessing looks like. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock or upon this revelation, or I could accurately say upon the book of the revelation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The book of the Revelation is not about the Antichrist. It's not about the false prophet or the great whore. Ten heads or seven heads and ten horns. It's about Jesus and who he is. You will not have a victorious Christian life without a revelation of Jesus Christ. Let me be more specific. Without this revelation of Jesus Christ we're talking about tonight. Three legs to a revelation to the understanding of who Jesus is. 
If you remove one of them, then you topple over or are easily pushed around. It is this. In the Gospels, we see him as Savior. In the epistles, we see him as Lord. And in the book of the Revelation, we see him as King. You remove any one of those revelations, you have an insufficient revelation, an unbalanced revelation of who Jesus is. And this Jesus has always been there from the beginning of his ministry in the Gospel of Mark when he tells a deranged man to shut up and then causes him to writhe in pain on the ground before he's set free. He sternly warns a blind man that he's just healed to keep his mouth shut and then kicks him out. He throws family members mourning the death of their child out of the room. He's often exasperated with the crowds, irritated with the disciples. He curses a fig tree. His attitude towards authorities is often disrespectful, calling them names like fox, blind guides, whitewashed tombs. These are not the passages of Scripture we normally sit and meditate on. Why waste your time? If you keep reading, you'll find something motivational or inspiring. No need to think about this Jesus. <laughs> but be forewarned. This is who he is. If you've been fascinated with the religion of niceness, you're going to be scared of this revelation of Jesus. Most are simply afraid of conflict. Jesus is not. Most Attempts to love are attempts to avoid conflict. Jesus never avoids conflict. He's often rude, sarcastic, and demeaning to those who are resistant to what he has to say because he loves them and he loves you. And sometimes people need to be rude to. This is not an excuse for you to be rude to your spouse or your children, or your parents. This is an excuse for you allow him to be rude to you. Would you allow him to do that? Would you allow him to interrupt you in the middle of your prayer and say, shut up? You're making things worse. He will if you let him. If you don't let him, then you just go on saying dumb things and making your life worse. One of the, one of the most important questions you could ever ask yourself is, will I allow God to be honest with me? It's one thing to be honest with God. It's another thing to let him be honest with you. And he does not deliver the truth with Novocaine. <laughs> Regrettably. We take the sword away from Jesus. We beat it into a plowshare and we hand it back to him and say, be nice. But the moment you domesticate Jesus, he's not there anymore. All you have now is religion. All you have now are good deeds. But you have no Savior who can reign over any situation. You put him in. Hmm. We're right to eschew false guilt, ungodly fear, and debilitating shame. But there remains plenty of true guilt, godly fear, and healthy shame. We have driven those out of the church. And yet, those are the feelings that stir us to move. Those feelings make us so uncomfortable. I'm not talking about the condemnation that the enemy puts on you. I'm talking about the fear of God. I'm talking about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that's far more dominating than any condemnation some person can put on you. The pain of these godly feelings, the pain that they inflict are meant to bring us discomfort, to move us, to illuminate what areas of our lives need to be fixed. So the question is, are you willing to make him king of kings of your life? Are you willing to see him as he is? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we come before you now. Not everyone is ready to make this commitment, but some of us are ready to see you as you are, even if it means dynamic change in our lives. Show us, God. 
Show us those things that are harming us. Show us those things that are stealing from us. Show us those things that do not look like you. Change them by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen and amen. How many of you are thankful for the revelation of Jesus Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you thank our online audience for joining us? Now, if you'll go to EncounterToday.com, you can sow into the nation of Israel, and that's what I want us to do right now. Get your offerings in your hand. You, this week, you have a homework assignment. Go to the YouTube channel, and those messages are there on the seven churches of Revelation. No more important revelation exists in the Bible. You would not believe the number of eye rolls I get from ministers when they go to say something about Jesus that is not scriptural. And I say, well, you know, in the book of Revelation, and before I can get it out, they've already shut it off because that's not for us. That's some strange book, some cryptic book that has nothing to do with us. Surely the Jesus in there is totally different. That's, a, that's an odd Jesus that's for a very narrow period of time. No, no, no. No. The most important revelation of Jesus is right here. And the scary thing is, it's easily understood. <laughs> Dive into it. Get into it. In Jesus' name. Everybody said?